about our culture and language mm -hmm. and this particular meeting. Um, I think we're happy with that. Um, welcome to the short educational forum we've done. Um, the agenda of the meeting is to go straight into having introductions from our two speakers. And then you know, the aim is maximum participation and questions. We're aiming to raise all of our levels to understand what's happening in economic austerity. So we're encouraging people to ask questions and, you know, whatever knowledge and whatever questions you have, this is the ideal time. You know, we get exposed to so much rubbish and we need to understand what's happening in the latest globally, in Europe, in Britain, and locally, people may have questions about. Um, before that, I just have to make an announcement um, that for fire safety, I'm asking everyone to fill out the list of names in this room. So make sure your name's down there and email if you're not on our list. The quickest way out of the building is you're still out of this door and right out the back door here of the room you see here. So hopefully you won't have a problem like that. Oh, the speakers are there. Yes, yes. And then there will be time at the end of the meeting after the discussion and questions, and I think we will be wrapping up around nine on that. I think we should be talking about the major initiatives we're involved in, um, the national demonstration festival, etc., and any other initiatives, but to see how we're building now. A lot of work's been done on email, but it's worth just going through what we're doing locally. Um, okay, so if everyone's happy with that, I propose we move on swiftly to our, what are going to be short and sweet introductions. We've got, welcome, we've got Mary Robertson, who'll be focusing on that housing crisis and the economic solution to that. But first of all, welcome Michael Burke, who is an economist, um, does work, social economic bulletin, commentary in The Guardian, and lots of other stuff. Um, welcome to an introduction in the context of what is happening and what are the, the ways out of this. Um, thanks, Richard, and thanks to everyone involved in the um, South East London People's Assembly at the Thursday for inviting me. And thanks to you for coming out on this horrible evening. Um, I think it's quite important that we discuss uh, the economics of austerity. Because one of the things that I'm sure a lot of you would have found in the course of campaigning and just discussing issues around austerity is that there are an awful lot of people out there who are pissed off and angry about what's going on. But even among those, you know, I'm thinking about trade union branches, political parties, campaign groups and whatnot, even among those, there's often a, an element of, well, there is a deficit, isn't there? You know, how are we going to get out of this? Um, that's got to be dealt with. Because we all know that if we get into too much debt, we've got a problem. And so I think it's quite important to discuss some of the economic arguments because we have to convince those people as well. I'm assuming everybody here is like, broadly against the therapy. Um, Otherwise, you're a glutton for punishment to come in here if you're in favour of it. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's sometimes simply not enough to be against something. You do have to have alternatives because you have to be able to convince people who would be on your side only they're wavering. And it's no fault of theirs. There's a deluge of this crap that happens every night on the news, every day in the newspapers, every day in the radio, in the radio which says that austerity is unavoidable. So I think it's quite important to discuss um, the economics of it and why um, it isn't true that's an alternative. As Richard mentioned, I'd write for a few things, but this is the main thing that I, I want to highlight. It's a blog with leaflets here, and I think we'll pass them around. Um, and I, sort of, I and other people regularly update the blog, so I direct people towards that for sort of ongoing arguments about um, why we need to oppose austerity and, and what the alternatives are. Okay, firstly, um, this isn't a lecture, it's a discussion, so I just want to point out some, some <coughs> key things and open the discussion that way. What's austerity? Um, I don't know, probably a lot of people are quite younger than me here in this room. Um, I don't know if you've seen the film, I watched it with my kids the other day. Uh, it's not a brilliant film, but it's all right. It's a film called Rent. Yes. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, it's not brilliant, I would say, but it's, it's okay. There's one scene in it. It's, it's mainly about the involvement of John Reed and other people. John Reed is a great socialist journalist. Um, in a series of events, including the Russian Revolution. 
And um, Rick has come back from the it's a great scene in it though, it's two great scenes, but this this particular one. When he's come back from the First World War and he's speaking to uh, a lunch of business people, I work with business men in Dickie Bows and whatnot, and they've all got the cigars and brandies out, and he's the after dinner speaker. And he's asked, um, what are the causes of the First World War? Because people didn't call it that at the time. What are the causes of the Great War? And he stands up and he says, profits, and he sits down again. <laughs> um, and uh, sometimes I'm tempted in these things to do that. What are the, why, are we, why do we have austerity, profits, and then sit down again? Um, but I'll flesh that out a little bit because um, I think it's important to. One of the most damaging things that anybody done or said in the course of this whole period is when uh, Liam Byrne, who was one of the members of the last government, a cabinet member, he famously left the note which said there's no money left. Um, and that sort of set the framework, if you like, for austerity. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm guessing that most people here have experienced one or more of the following over the past period. Their rent has gone up, or their food bill has gone up, or their utility bills have gone up, or their fares have gone up, or possibly all of the above. If none of the above, you really are in the wrong room. <laughs> um, but if your rent has gone up, if your food bill has gone up, and so on, your utility <coughs> bill has gone up, that means you've got less money, but that means your landlord has got more money. That means that Tesco's has got more money, it means Southern Electric has got more money, it means Transport for London has got more money, and so on and so on. I.e. there's not less money in the economy, it's fractionally. Now we're that close, we're told constantly this is a recovery, but we're, we're that far away from where we were in, in 2008, less than 1% away from where we were in 2008. It's a, it's a tiny fall right now relative to where we were, but it's not a tiny fall for most people. Most people are very substantially worse off. And that's a re reason for that, is because there's a transfer of incomes. That's what austerity is. It's a transfer of incomes from you, uh, from ordinary people, uh, from working people and the poor, to large corporations. Um, and that's effectively a transfer of income from labour and the poor capital and the rich. That's what austerity is about. That's, what, that's the content of austerity. So it doesn't mean there's less money, it just means it's in different hands, it's not yours. Um, and I think that's quite important to understand in terms of why we're in this crisis and how to get out of it. Secondly, we're told that there's a recovery. Now again, I doubt very much if anybody here is feeling that. Um, and the key components of what most people are feeling are falling real incomes, i.e. their wages aren't keeping up with the inflation, lower um, incomes from <coughs> benefits, from social security entitlements, many, many cases which people already <coughs> pay for through their taxes, and uh, higher prices. Those keep on rising. And the result is that although we're a fraction away from uh, where we were in 2008, most people are substantially worse off. That means that when people talk about a recovery and the government and its supporters and the supporters of austerity, which are it's quite a broad network of people stretching far beyond the government, when they talk about um, recovery, there's no recovery in it for ordinary people. That means what they're talking about is a recovery in profit. That's the, that's the basis of the recovery they're talking about. Now, we live in a capitalist economy, and the driver of capitalism is profitability. The key problem about this scenario is that profits are going back up. They haven't recovered fully in 2008, but they have gone back up. But they're not investing. They're not investing those profits. So the infrastructure that we have continues to deteriorate. Homes aren't getting built, and I don't want to speak too much about that, because Mary's the expert on that, she's going to speak in much more depth on that. So that's why we have a housing crisis, is because there's no homes <coughs> being built, or insufficient homes being built. 
Um, and businesses aren't investing, with one or two exceptions. Um, businesses aren't, so not creating jobs, not creating properly paid jobs. So we have this falling unemployment, which is basically a zero hours part-time falling <coughs> unemployment, i.e. people are working um, either all the hours God says, you know, two and three jobs sometimes, or the zero hours, or, you know, and so on. And they're making next to no money. And if they're simultaneously on benefit, those benefits are being cut, like housing benefits. The fact is, you know, people talk about the housing benefit bill. The housing benefit is there are soars in this country. The numbers of people on housing benefits stay broadly stable. That means this is huge amount of money going to landlords. Uh, and that's a big component of the of, of the deficit. So the recovery isn't happening for most people. It's not going to. Because if the purpose of austerity is to carry on transferring incomes from labour and the poor to capital and the rich, they're going to carry on doing that until they either don't have to anymore, i.e. they feel very comfortable about future profits, or actually more likely, for as long as they can get away with it. And they've got away with it to date. So one of the things about the most recent election, people focus on the talk about the recovery. Um, and how this is going to save the Tory party, um, which is languishing you know, in the low 30s or even lower in the opinion polls, and came first. You know, the poll was gushy here with about earthquakes. Actually, what the real, one of the real earthquakes the party, is that the governing party came first, so it doesn't happen in the British election. And that's not going to happen. That really, that the, the recovery itself is not going to benefit the Tory party because the recovery only benefits a tiny fraction of society. You see it in London. London's supposed to be the area where everything's booming, everything's going ahead, everything's marvellous. The um, Tory vote collapsed in London, and UKIP hardly got a look in. So if that's going to be the, their answer to the, their uh, political crisis, that alone isn't going to work for them. So what's the alternative? If that's the purpose of austerity, and um, recovery is not happening for most people. Um, what's the alternative? Well, the first thing to say on that is that this is a phenomenon which is taking place um, all over the advanced industrialised countries. Countries like Britain, but also France, Germany, Italy, Spain, etc. Also the United States, Canada, Australia, uh, all those countries. Um, so what everyone thinks about um, Gordon Brown, I have my own criticism for Gordon Brown, he really didn't cause a global financial crisis. Um, <laughs> um, and he didn't bring Lehman Brothers down and all the rest of it. Uh, he helped contribute to the <coughs> general global economic crisis, but he wasn't the cause of it. This is a phenomenon taking place all over all the advanced industrialised countries because profits have fallen, and they won't invest until profits recover. So, what we have is the continuation of austerity policies. Actually, we've been in a little period now when nothing new much is happening on the austerity front. I know things get progressively worse in terms of how people feel, but actually since 2011 or so, the government hasn't implemented any new austerity measures. They haven't rolled back on what they've already done. That's because their poll ratings collapsed. So they actually went up after the election to just above 40%. They went to 30% or below after what was called, remember, you remember the Omni Shambles budget? So they haven't implemented new austerity measures, they just let the old ones carry on and work their magic. Um, and those are being saved up for us post um, May 2015. Um, but they're going to carry on doing this. Um, they're going to carry on doing this for as far as the eye can see. You know, talking about at least until the end of the next parliament, so um, 2015. Um, and it's not going to work. It's not gonna, it's gonna, in, terms of, in terms of an economic recovery, it's not going to work. We've, we've already had years of this. Everywhere it's been tried, we've had um, uh, no economic growth or you know, very little economic growth. And we're not going to. Um, the only way it works is for them, it works for capital and the rich, i.e. it improves their position, it does raise profitability, and it does improve the wealth of the rich. And at some point, 
in the future, I don't have a crystal ball at some point, they are graciously going to deign to invest. They're going to decide, actually, we've clobbered you all so hard now that our profits have recovered and we will invest. But by that stage, we'll have no NHS left. Um, if anybody remembers Thatcherism, the country was a mess. Uh, potholes in the road, trains that didn't work properly, etc., etc., uh, because the infrastructure fell and the crisis in housing is going to get worse and worse, and so on and so on. Uh, that's one way out of the crisis. The other way out of the crisis, oh, and I should say here, all this guff you hear about the deficit is just nonsense. There is a deficit, but there's basically just three actors in the economy in terms of who can, who are the big spenders, who are the big savers. And, a, and actually, leaving aside what happens in the rest of the world for the time being, what they do always has to equal each other. We don't, we don't trade with Mars. So what they do always has to equal each other. So if I borrow from you, I owe you money. So that means you've got, you owe, you own my debt. So I have to pay you money. So if the government is in debt, it has to owe the money to someone. So there's always, there's always some debt in the economy. What the government has done, by talking about the deficit and cutting government spending, is it's transferred the debt from itself and the deficit from itself to ordinary people. That's what the recovery is. That's why a lot of people actually feel worse off. Because what this means is, is that housing fuels um, recovery with more debt. Um, a credit fuels debt, including for cars, most cars, uh, purchases of cars account for about a quarter of all the growth we've seen over the past period. Um, and it's all debt fuel. It's all um, uh, deferred um, interest payments, which, is, which will start to accumulate at some point in the future. So we're feeling worse off, and the government's better than you know, to try and buy crap from us. But it follows that if the government has still got a deficit, and households are increasing in debt, but someone else who hasn't got a debt has got an increasing surplus, and that's companies. There's a cash mountain that British companies are sitting on. And I've done lots of work on this, and when I started to do work on it, there wasn't many people doing it, and lo and behold, the Bank of England, who had all this data, suddenly made it very, very difficult to get hold of the data. <laughs> um, but there's something like three, at least 350 billion of surplus. That's a cash mountain held by British companies sitting in banks, which I, I sometimes say is doing nothing. It's worse than doing nothing, because what it's actually doing is fueling the housing needs, the rising the, um, the um, house prices. And other commodities and so on. That's what it's, it's doing. It's worse than nothing. What we need to do as an alternative is go to the source of the problem. If the source of austerity is the transfer of income is from capital, sorry, from workers and the poor to capital and the rich, we just need to make the reverse transfer. <laughs> it's very simple in terms of economic terms very much more difficult to achieve politically. Governments in Britain tend not to do this. Um, but what it means is we need to take some money off them and give it to us. Even if it's done indirectly, because the key deficit in this country is not whether it's governments or households or businesses, it's actually we have a deficit of investment. That's the, that's the source of the crisis. There is no investment. Everything else is pretty much either it's recovered or it's close to recovery. Now, sometimes people say, well, you know, we have an unsustainable economic model um, and we really shouldn't carry on in this way. Absolutely agree. I couldn't agree more. But what I mean by investment is things that actually produce stuff, not speculation on housing. Um, and actually, one of the big challenges this uh, society faces, and actually the whole of the world faces, is the crisis of climate change. And in order to deal with that, we have to have a huge level of investment, uh, which actually creates jobs and it reduces carbon emissions. It means a huge transfer of resources and investment and what in the old fashioned terms was the means called means production away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy. And that will uh, create jobs, green the economy uh, and reduce 
first import and then reduce the amount of um, carbon being produced locally economy and globally. That's what's needed. And that's a huge challenge, but that's a challenge that can only be met by investment. So that's what we need to do. And so, for example, to finish on this, because I know I've um, probably spoken already too long. Sorry. It's okay. um, but to take a small example, what I mean by this, to make it sort of concrete and not abstract and use a lot of words and, and there's a terrible thing in economics to try to blind people with terminology which is to exclude ordinary people. And one of the great things about people is disassembly is it's actually to attempt to include ordinary people as human. Is Ed Miliband has talked about um, freezing household fuel bills uh, for 17 or 18 months, something like that. Which, as far as I can make out, is one of the few concrete pledges that Labour's actually got. Um, it's not much, um, and we can easily see how energy companies might get around it, because they might, for example, whack up energy prices first, or um, whack them up as soon as the price freeze is over, or both. So uh, that could be quite comfortable. But that's the, that's the pledge. It's, it's supposed to highlight the energy <coughs> crisis, although I don't think it's an answer to it. But actually, that's only one part of the overall energy crisis. We have huge energy bills in this country, and we have the crisis I mentioned, which is the crisis of climate change. So what's actually required in terms of energy policy, just taking that one alone, is we have to have a huge level of investment for a transfer away from fossil fuels um, to renewable energy, which will itself create jobs and highly paid jobs because they're highly technical, highly skilled jobs. But in order to do that, you have to get the energy companies to do that. But we privatise them in this country. And when Ed Miliband talks about this tiny little change in energy bills for 17 or 18 months, they said they've gone on, on an investment strike. And we're already at a point which we're in danger of having insufficient energy. There could be energy shortages in this country. Because lo and behold, once they, pri they were privatised, they didn't invest in energy capacity. So that's what they're threatening with this tiny little thing. They have no intention of addressing the challenge of climate change. So it's, it's blindingly obvious that we need to take control of the energy companies and direct the investment towards renewables. So that's one simple aspect. That applies to housing, that applies to wholesale, that applies to um, renationalising the NHS, which has been privatised piecemeal, that applies to uh, transport, and so on and so on. So what's required is a massive level of state-led investment to end this crisis. The alternative is what we've got so uh, now, is to carry on economic stagnation, growth that's driven by debt and creating zero hours jobs, and carrying this on until at some point in the future they decide graciously that they will, are willing to invest after they've clobbered everything up. I think that's the real alternative in relation to um, what's going to Thanks a lot. That's great. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure everyone's got lots of questions. I've got a number, but so that we can... <coughs> now,